if we do not control our own land, if we do not control our own means of survival, then you can't judge us. God will not judge us. We're like children, innocent, in, in need of knowledge. In, in, we're almost silly at times as a, as a group, as a, as a total group, the way we act, the way we depict ourselves on television, the way we're being depicted in mass media. We're not in control of this. So the only way you could judge a person is if they're in control of their actions. Anyone who is not really in control of their actions is what? Innocent. So the life of KRS-One before uh, Scott LaRock, before Boogie Down Productions, actually before 1985, uh, the group Boogie Down Productions, Boogie Down Productions, uh, was formed in 85 by myself and Scott LaRock, Scott Sterling. Scott Sterling was a social worker at the shelter, uh, a homeless shelter, and I was one of the 740 homeless people there. Most of my story goes forward from there with the social worker, Scott Sterling, becoming my um, DJ. But before this, counting backwards, 84, 83, 82, 81, I'm in the street, basically, uh, off and on. It started at about 13 years old. It started really at about 12, 13, somewhere between there. I had a vision of myself, and it was, it was really a, a spiritual moment for me, maybe because I was young, maybe whatever it was. I always remember it <clears throat> as one of these moments where... It, it, was, it was more than a dream. It was more than just uh, an idea that enters your head. I saw myself teaching people through rhyme, through poetry, and I saw myself as a philosopher, as even a prophet, uh, and I saw myself rhyming to people in that way. Now, when I was coming up, rap or emceeing, as it was known then, E-M-C-E-E-I-N, emceeing, uh, also M dot C dot, ING, Master of Ceremonying or MCing. This art, DJing and MCing in the playgrounds of New York, Bronx, Brooklyn, mostly Manhattan, Harlem, uh, this is the only place where we was able to see a DJ or see an MC. We saw them uh, at the park. And I just knew in my own heart that I was going to be a DJ or an MC or a graffiti writer, b-boy. I was one of these people or all of them. This scene, this early scene that we used to call the jam, this early scene which would become hip-hop is what I gravitated to when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old. By the time I get to 12, 13 years old, entering my teenage years, I've already made up in my mind I'm an MC and a philosopher. That's it. I told this to my mother. She agreed with the philosopher part, but the MC part, it was, it was too young. It was too new to even understand how a person would even make a living doing this. And so a few things, one thing led to another, and I wind up leaving school, which was not good with my mother at all. I was in junior high school. I got left back in the eighth grade twice. I never really seen high school. I was supposed to go to Grady, uh, William Grady High School in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. Never really went. Um, and then I guess I was supposed to go to college. Of course, never saw that. Uh, but where I was was the Brooklyn Public Library uh, is where I began to educate myself. I got in there, started reading philosophy while writing rhymes on, on the side, but mostly trying to form a conversation. I wanted to be able to discuss philosophy with other philosophers or if someone asked me, you know, so what do you do? What are you doing? Uh, kind of thing. I, I wanted to be able to say, I am a philosopher and here's what I could be, here's what I can uh, discuss. So I'm in the library giving myself a conversation, basically. I'm studying new words, vocabulary words, I'm writing down on toilet tissue uh, along with my rhymes. Um, and I'm studying philosophy, all kinds of different brands of philosophy. Uh, I'm getting into that, uh, the origins of knowledge and uh, the origins of causes or what is it that causes a thing to, metaphysics basically, uh, the first causes of, 
of, of things, uh, uh, where knowledge actually comes from, things like time, space, of course, Einstein, uh, Copernicus, uh, and this is where philosophy leads you to, um, Sir Isaac Newton and all of them, uh, because back then, science and philosophy and spirituality really came out of the same mind. So when you're back there studying philosophy, and you're, down, you're past the 17th century, 1615, you're even going before Christ, you start, all of this starts to mesh together. So I got a wide range of information just studying philosophy. So one day I um, find myself out in the street after a big argument with, with my mother. And I'm out in the street and I'm now, I'm, I'm actually kind of happy that I'm out in the street uh, because now I really can pursue my goal. And this is the kind of insanity that I went through. And I have to use the word insanity because that's what it was. I had to actually psych myself out to believe that I was KRS-One or this character that I was going to self-create as. And I, and I hope I'm saying the right thing because it's so insane what I'm even saying. To, to think yourself into the reality you want to be in, too, uh, is a form of insanity. And so here I am out in the street, homeless, insane, uh, dreaming myself as KRS-One, as this person that I'm not yet, but I'm only wanting to be this person, and the beginnings of this person started in the street. So I'm in the street, I'm living there, uh, park bench, I'm educating myself at the Brooklyn Public Library in the day because it's warm there too. And I managed to make it over to the Manhattan, the Manhattan Public Library, Manhattan, the Bowery, Men's Shelter, all of that. From there, I go out to, to the Bronx, to 166th Street in Boston Road. There, I meet a social worker named Scott Sterling. And this is where Boogie Down Productions kind of, begin, kind of begins. It's this homeless guy seeking his own vision and dream, childhood vision and dream, by the way. When I met Scott, I was 21. Uh, and seeking his childhood vision and, and dream uh, through the shelter system, through being homeless, through having nothing, really, and living this kind of insanity. I meet Scott Sterling, so yeah, and that's how it began. You know, I personally am not the type of person to advocate that a, a, a civilization should be armed, but I'm not naive to believe that other civilizations are not arming themselves up to invade, uh, uh, protect themselves against a, whatever perceived threat. The, the problem is not so much guns. It's, it's the arms race that seems to be within the minds of humanity. If one guy has a stick and, and he has a stick for protection, I suddenly feel less than him because he has a stick. So I start reaching around for my stick. And at least he's not going to club me over the head with his stick. I know this is going to sound crazy uh, coming from a person, KRS-One, someone who advocates peace, uh, someone who still stands by the term stop the violence. The craziness of it all, though, is that I don't think you should ever give up your gun or your weapon, your knife, your stick, uh, your baseball bat. In, in a society, in, in the societies in which we live, it un it's unfortunate that we haven't gotten past the more animalistic instincts of rape, the strong survive, only the strong survive, the strong overcomes the weak, this kind of mentality. You would think in a civilization that human beings can agree on coming together nonviolently, that the one thing we're not going to be in this particular society is violent. You would think that humanity can come together like that and at least live in certain pockets of existence like this, but this is not the case. What's the case is, it seems that if you are lumped in to what seems to be 
an outdoor psychiatric nursery for human beings. That's what we call a city. An outdoor psych psychiatric nursery. If this is where we are, if this is what it's really about, you can't give up your weapon because the arms race is on. A clear psychopath is with you, living with you, riding on the train with you, a person who may be depressed, manic depressant, not that this is to be taken lightly at all, but a person who could snap at any moment is always with you in a society, always. People who want to do you harm separately from those who could snap, those who just have conditions of the mind you are living with daily, separate from them. You have people who want to rob you, want to overpower you, want what, what you have, want to take by force. You're living amongst them, too. I can go on and on, but if you're living amongst this type of person, this type of group, these groups are around you, I cannot advocate that any person give up their weapon at all. In fact, what I would advocate, advocate is that you learn how to use your weapon well, that innocent people do not get harmed if you ever, God forbid, have to pull your weapon out. You know exactly how to use it. You know for what length of time you're going to use it. And you operate like a shogun. Uh, you show no emotion. Uh, you don't put anger on it. You don't put fear on it. You don't even put happiness on it. What you put on it is the threat is stopped. The threat is stopped. Once the threat is stopped, there's no reason for your aggression or hostility anymore. This is the way I would advise that a person uses their weapon. It's not the weapon itself. It's the consciousness that's holding the weapon that determines whether that weapon is going to be violent, nonviolent, destructive, or creative. You know, I have a lot of respect for the British royal family. Uh, and I know that's light words, so I have respect, I don't even know them. Uh, but I can only imagine what it must be like to be part of the royal family. And I mean, even the darker parts of that, being born into a family of such high prestige and what you have to accept of your family. In a lot of ways, we all share the same problems as the British royal family, born into a family that you know, has its dark secrets and its major victories. And you have to try to uphold the victories and try to either mend the sins of the father or try to forget them altogether. <laughs> either way, um, the British royal family, I think, is a, is a good uh, uh, microcosm of all families in a lot of ways. Uh, it's still a family. People don't agree, they don't get along, there's betrayals, there's ignorance, there's all kinds of things going on. But there's another word that's attached to that family, and that's called royal family. Moving away from the British royal family and moving just into a royal family, there are many throughout the, the, the world, actually, real royal families. But what is it to be royalty? What, what is it to really be royal? Uh, to be that. To me, uh, when I look at what a queen or a king, a prince, princess, uh, when, when I look at that, I notice that I take it from the ancient African point of view, uh, where the king was a divine ruler, um, someone that uh, you, you, you didn't, this person didn't have to campaign for you to believe in them. This person didn't have to spend uh, millions of dollars to convince you through media that this person was the king. When this person walks in the room, you immediately know through vibration that this person is the king or the queen or the prince or the princess. Uh, you know this. A real king. Uh, does not ha ever have to say he's the king. A real queen never really has to say she's the queen. You know who the king or the queen is simply by the person's character, by the person's aura, by the person's reputation even, which is even after that, but nonetheless reputation. So, again, royal family, first you got to have some power on you, some real power. 
And this is where I would split the the point of view. I, I would split it uh, uh, and say, well, there is a the true royal families, families of kings and queens, no doubt. Um, but then there is the royal family that is like like the Jacksons, for instance, uh, would be called a royal family. Um, uh, even um, uh, Run's house, that's not the name of his family, the Simmons family, I guess, uh, in, in, in that sense, that would be a royal family where, you know, people who the whole family is considered special celebrity, uh, this kind of thing. I consider my family a royal family uh, as as well. My wife is phenomenal. Older sons, uh, daughter, we, we, we're all out of control. Uh, and I'm proud of my family, no doubt. But the pride of a father doesn't make your family royal. What makes your family royal is that they are upholding the royalty, the tradition, the the breastplate. Uh, they're holding that up of the family. And this is another piece of being royal. It's not just exuding some sort of uh, honor when you walk in the room, but also, can you uphold your traditions, your regular family traditions? This is also a form of royalty. So a royal family just in the end, not only is it uh, the British royal family, uh, African royal families, Asian royal families, uh, in, in that sense. Not only is it that, but a royal family is also a family that's alive and vibrant and people know that family over there is really doing it.